everybody um, we are back today with a softer topic on our webinar series where we are looking at leadership and how we deal especially in these times of crisis this is um, Tex has been so kind as to move us into thinking about leadership rather than just about um, all the technical discussions we've had in the last two weeks or so so this is a follow-up from the previous uh, presentation. So I am not going to go into a lot of detail today in terms of introduction, but, um, but we can um, almost st uh, start as soon as Tex, Tex is currently um, managing a company, Dreams Made Possible, which I think is very appropriate for the work that we are going to talk about today. And he's also the HR manager at Mintech. And um, in these difficult times, it's always worth hearing from somebody who's a specialist. Um, I introduced Tex to present to us on integrating employees for impact post the pandemic. Um, I think it's a very interesting topic. Thank you, Tex, you may go ahead. She's there. Thanks again, Isabella, for, for, for just the kind introduction and for Camila working behind the scenes, but also to everyone who has joined this webinar this morning. And it is my pleasure to share with you some of the nuggets um, that I believe if we focus on, on, on implementing them, they will assist employees to return to work with um, a bit of impactful uh, impact and make an impactful uh, difference. Uh, when they, they arrive back at, at work. But let me just put a context and just explain that we are um, working within the space that really none of us know how it will turn. And that is what we call the VUCA world. And that is the world where things are volatile, they are uncertain, they are complex, and they are ambiguous. And th this is, by the way, not a new concept at all. However, I think the current situation just puts it out there. It, it explains it much better for us to understand what this VUCA world is all And if you look at the, the first aspect, which is volatility, it is a requirement or, or a world that requires leaders to act quickly to ongoing challenges that are unpredictable and that are out of their control. And that puts a challenge on leaders to say, now how do I act in situations where things are unpredictable and out of control, but I'm expected to give a semblance of control and predictability to what is happening. You know, it's, it's a bit of an unfair challenge, but unfortunately that is what leadership is made of so that people can be able to stand up and be counted when it matters most. And this is a world that we say is very, very uncertain. And as a leader, you are expected to take action um, without certainty. You know, and, and for me, this is um, a principle of my boy's school, puts it so well. He sent a message to parents, and the message was about the document which was leaked about the grade 12s and the grade 7s having to go back into uh, the school environment. And he was saying in that document, for most parents, those, uh, they thought it was a done deal. That is the plan that they saw. They thought that it was a done deal. But then he goes on to say something very pertinent for me, and he says, living in uncertain times has taught us that very little is absolutely certain. Because we thought that this was a certain way to go forward, as a, 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 a complete way to go forward, but there was a bit of a twist in the whole process because that was an ongoing discussion and nothing was finalized as a result of that plan. And as a result, it was just what it was, 
um, having to deal with what is uncertain. And we saw as well that the minister was supposed to address parents at two o'clock yesterday, but also that did not happen in to show that we are working in this world that is continuously uncertain and um, we are expected to give leadership under those conditions. The third aspect is about complexity. And the word of, uh, I mean, the, the, the C in the word VUCA is about complexity, which is simply means that we are working in this dynamic environment, which has got so many interdependencies. Now, going back to the whole issue of reintegrating or reopening our work environments, there are a number of interdependencies that are play, at play here. It's not only about company A saying, tomorrow we are going to open. But it's about leaders thinking through other things. For example, will our employees have transport? How is that going to be regulated? What happens to the parents at home uh, because schools are not yet open? What happens to daycare centers? How do we balance those family commitments and the ability to go back to work? So that is the complexity of interconnectedness of factors that leaders will have to look at as we go through um, this process and thinking about reintegration or reopening plans. And the last letter there, which is ambiguous, is about working in this unfamiliar space, the terrain that is outside our expertise. And, and probably most of you will agree with me that um, as um, this, process, this lockdown and the coronavirus uh, unfolded, we started to see that our expertise in some of the areas started to be challenged. Um, for example, just in, 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 in human resources, I, I know that at the beginning of the lockdown, um, the, the labor law experts were trying to find out really what is it that companies are allowed or not allowed to do. Because if you look at our Labor Relations Act, it was not written for these types of uh, crisis or pandemic. So they had to go back and think deeply about what is it that companies can and cannot do during this particular phase. The same put a burden on, for example, the insurance industries, um, whether to give people leeway and say, I'm, we are suspending the payment towards the insurances, um, the, bank, the banks, for example, what is it that they needed to do in this instance to cater for those employees whose employers might not have been able to pay them at this instance. So that is the world of ambiguity, the terrain that challenges the normal way in which we do things. So this VUCA world has not ended and will not end at the moment we're saying we are reopening the doors and starting business again. And think of it this way. It simply means that there is no light switch moment, meaning we cannot take things lightly. So we cannot freak on and off and saying by Monday, everything is hunky-dory. We are just going to go back into the world of work and things are going to flow. So how we deal with this reintegration is very, very critical. So um, we are planning for gradual return, but things remain, will, will remain uh, being rough and tough as we go on. For example, Moody's have just announced that probably they project a, a a decline by 6.5% of our GDP at the end of the fiscal year. And that puts a challenge on companies to say, how are they going to go throughout this phase? The deaths have risen to 90. We don't know what the, uh, the, the, the end of today will look like uh, when you look at the number of people who unfortunately would have died as a result of coronavirus. You know, when you look at the president's announcement, it it does not imply a linear line into integration. We are at level five, we are planning to go to level four, and the human mind will say from four we need to go to three and then to two and ultimately to one. But also that is not guaranteed. That, chose, that goes back to the VUCA world. Now things are uncertain, things are complex because we rely on a lot of interdependencies, one of them being human behavior. Are we going to, even as companies, do the right things that will help to flatten the curve? Are human uh, individuals going to do what is necessary to, to, to flatten the curve? Or are we going to be happy and excited that uh, the, the, we are moving to level four and things should be hunky-dory? So even the plans that we are putting in place at this moment in terms of reintegration, 
I'd be challenged at some point, depending on how things will, uh, will evolve. So that is where flexibility and adaptability come into play as we go through these phases. Now the question is, what do you as a leader need to do to prepare for this um, reintegration or reopening? And my answer is simple. My answer is, it is not only about reopening. It is about integrating employees for impact by building their resilience. This is a time when employees need to push back against the forces, uh, the, the forces and the, 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 the storms that are coming. And this is about the time now that we have to deal with more boldly with economic, financial, the health and societal uh, challenges that we have. But most importantly, even personal challenges in terms of where are we as individuals? Um, have we been able to find ourselves at this moment because we will need ourselves to be resilient in this process? So leaders should be able to assist their employees and their organizations to collectively build physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual fortitude, uh, fortitude so that we can be able to integrate every uh, employee seamlessly into the work environment. And that is not going to be easy. It is not going to be easy, and it was never meant to be easy, even at the start. But that is what we need to be aware of, that as we go through this phase, that is some of the challenges that we'll have to, um, to, 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 to face and ensure that we bring employees in the most careful and gradual way. Now, what is this concept? What does resilience have to do with reopening? And let us borrow from researchers in this field. Um, the American Psychological Association defines resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of stress. And there's a key word there, adapting well in the face of adversity. But also there are other researchers like Dr. Southwick and her, his colleagues, uh, Dr. Bannon, um, Dr. Uh, Pentic, Brick, and, and, and the like, who collectively end up agreeing that resilience is about a healthy, adaptive, or integrated positive functioning over the passage of time in the aftermath of adversity. So this simply tells us that when employees go back into a work environment, we would like to restore a positive functioning. So again, like I said, it, it does not necessarily mean that things are going to be simple and um, employees are just going to be integrated with ease into a work environment because there are a number of things that we need to look at to make sure that that positive functioning is being restored. So this does not necessarily mean that we take light what employees are going through at this moment, but it's just to make sure that the the trauma, the strategies, and the threats that some of the employees have are taken care of so that they can be able to be moved swiftly into the work environment. So for me, um, at a personal level, when I read what the Psychological Association and the other researchers like Dr. Southwick and many others out there say about resilience, for me it is about how do I manage my energy as an individual? But now as a leader, how do I manage the energy of the organization to make sure that when employees come into the organization, the energy is positive, it is open, and um, it allows the seamless integration into the work environment. But secondly, how do I shift my perspective? How do I start to shift my outlook so that I can be able to focus on the right things? Because the human mind seems to be structured in a way that always pulls people to the negative, where the negative stuff always overwhelms us as individuals. So it takes mental fortitude, it takes uh, physical, spiritual, and emotional fortitude for somebody to be able to change the perspective. And, and we need as leaders 
to be able to create the oasis, the environment where employees are able or are assisted to change their perspective and the outlook of how things are so that they can be able to find a sense of purpose because resilience is also about finding that sense of purpose in the midst of calamity, in the midst of the challenges that we are faced with at, this, at a particular point in time. You know, one of the, uh, we, we, we probably most know about Viktor Frankl, who was um, one of the prisoners um, during the, the Holocaust. And he said that one of the things that kept him going during that period was to make take notes, which is the general in part, and thinking about what he was going to teach his psychiatry students post the incarceration. So he did not uh, succumb to the, second, the environment that, is, that, is, that was around him, but he saw himself over, beyond the circumstances that were surrounding him. And that's all about what we need to assist employees. And Victor Frankl was saying, focus on what is left than what is lost. And that is what as leaders we need to do. And I am not by any stretch of imagination suggesting that it is going to be easy. It is going to be tough. Hence, as leaders, we firstly need also to build our own resilience so that we can be able to assist our employees to go forward and build those resilience. You will remember that during our last discussions, the last slide was about you as a leader. Think about it as a cup. Fill your cup first so that you can be able to give others. So you need to build yourself around your own energy, your ability to change perspective and outlook so that you can be able to find a higher purpose and shift your employees in a way that they will focus on what is left rather than what is lost and build on top of that so that we can build a resilience workforce that will pick up the pieces where they were left and then start to build more um, towards the future. Now, how do we do that? And as we ponder about this reintegration, we cannot rely on assumptions. Again, making connections back to the initial conversation that we had. I had put forward a question to say, what are those things that we might have neglected or things that we might have looked at but not leveraged effectively? And most of those things are in the structures, the protocols, the processes and the technology. But I also did mention that we need emotional and cultural awareness. And this becomes even more needed as we go through the reintegration process. The part that you see there on the left of your screen, of, uh, I hope it is left of your screen, is are things that are receiving more attention. But the psychological and behavioral responses of employees are always taken lightly or they are neglected. And the reason sometimes is because there's the assumption that employees will turn up when they are needed. Now we're talking reintegration. Um, it is not a given that because employees are called to come back on a Monday that automatically they'll be excited and they will come. Yes, employees want to move out of their houses. Yes, employees need um, a comfort and confirmation and assurance that they still have got jobs but it does not come as a given that they are excited just to stand up and come to work. And this becomes important to take into consideration when we start to shift and change gears and start to move into uh, the reopening phase. And, and let me help by giving context to what I've um, just articulated in terms of uh, not taking it as an assumption that employees uh, will be excited and just wanting to go back to work. Let me just show you a study that was done by Deloitte in 2015 with King's College in London. And they interviewed and also sent surveys to 321 employees in the energy, the health and the petroleum sectors. And they were looking at employees' responses in terms of going back to work. And one of the key questions that I had asked was, 
which, which, is, uh, which shows the results there on the screen. If you are able to get to work during an extreme event, would you be willing to do so? Now from the results that you see there, the outcome just helps us to understand the perception of employees about risks and about how we as organizations can be able to take the opportunity to educate and even to dispel some of the myths about returning back to work. Because um, there they are a lot of things that are going in the minds of our employees uh, as we speak right now. Let's look at, at the chart. Look at um, if there was a severe storm. Those results simply tells me that employees will say, I, not, a, no, not a problem, 89% say we'll go back to work uh, because probably they will put up their jackets, keep warm, and then go back, uh, go to work. Um, the same with this um, a severe flooding. Yes, maybe people will be concerned about their houses being washed by water, their cars being taken, but they would still go uh, to work. But look as the, the curve start to slide down. You know, for example, if a pandemic like flu, 55% in that study said, yes, we, are, we will be able to go to work. But look at the numbers of people who um, say they will not go back to work, whether they're neutral and those, or those who said absolutely they, they will not be willing to come to work. 45% is a big number. And as you read the study, and uh, based on the interviews that were just uh, um, supporting the responses, even within the 55%, there were people who were saying, sometimes I just have to work, go back to work because I have to, you know. So 45% might be a big number as an example. So how does it talk to us? It simply means that uh, we should not take it for granted that employees need to go back to work. Um, companies, even at this time, some companies have been calling people to go back to work, but people have been going uh, hesitantly so because of some perceived risks um, uh, to go back to the work environment uh, and other interdependencies that we mentioned before. Will I be safe on the road? Uh, will I be stopped? And all those things. But as you can see, the release of small folks, only 29% said, definitely will go back to work. But the majority of the employees said, no, we, we will not be willing to go back to work. So I'm not saying it's going to be necessarily the case with us and, uh, and our employees when we go back to work. But even if you can talk to your employees individually, you talk to your friends, um, you talk to your family, you start to understand that people have got fears, they've got doubts. And those are psychological and behavioral issues that when we do the integration plan, we should not take for granted. We should um, take into cognizance and appreciate that they are some of the things that we should deal with within our integration plan and alleviate some of the fears that people might have as a result of going back to work. Now, let's look at a few pointers that we can look at as part of our reintegration plan. And it is about building resilience of the workforce and mainly to help employees become more productive again. Now, employees can become productive once they have been assisted to become resilient once the fears have been alleviated. Um, we, we all know about performance anxiety. People do not perform well once they are anxious. So your plan should, be, should work towards assisting employees to be more resilient and to have less anxiety. And um, their fears at least being mitigated to a larger extent because um, the reality is we might not be able to deal with all of these fears. We said we are operating in a VUCA world, and in this VUCA world, you are not guaranteed of uh, what is coming next because of the uncertainty that we had spoken about. But also, before I go into the details of the plan, I would also like to reiterate what I said at the beginning to say, this plan is not cast in stone because it will have to be adjusted depending on how things unfold with the reopening. We might be saying, hey, we are going back to work next week, Monday. Within a week, 
we, there might be an announcement that says, go come back to, uh, I mean, go back to your homes and then um, the lockdown rules are being revisited again. But we'll talk about some of the implications of those um, in, in a few next slides. The first and the most critical thing is what we expected at the beginning of the lockdown with leadership. Leaders are central to the success of an organization. Again, let me just repeat with what John Maxwell once said. He said, organizations will grow to a point where the leader grows. So if a leader is growing up to here, the organization will always be here. So when the leader grows, the organization will come. And as well as the direction that leaders are expected to give during the reintegration will act as a buffer to provide confidence to our employees and for them to understand why they need to come back to work. So it's not a matter of uh, leaders using power and authority and saying, thou shall come to work on this particular day, but it's to give your plan a semblance of integrity that communicates that you as an organization are clear about that which you are doing when you call employees to come back to work. And it starts by giving somebody authority to be in charge of the reintegration plan so that all the different parts of the organizations do not talk uh, separately, but they are integrated at a particular central point so that you start dispelling any signs of disorganization that might come as a result of the perceived lack of direction or purpose that might be coming from the leadership of your organization. So for you to be able to uh, ensure employees that they are coming into a better organization, give them confidence so that you can restore order and direction. And most importantly, give your employees a higher purpose. So we are at that time where as leaders, we need to communicate to employees that it is not about profits and them just coming back to work. Yes, somebody might argue that now employees as well wants to have money. Good that we all have want money, we want to go back to the work environment. But it is not about rushing employees so that we can make profits, but we need to start communicating as part of that plan. And that we are concentrating or focusing on something bigger than us, something that will start to benefit the society. Last time we spoke about creating shared value. So this is a moment when you communicate or, or you take leadership and you communicate to employees. You start to communicate this higher value as to why employees need to come to bed at this point in time, especially once we start talking about the gradual reintegration into the workplace, which leads us to the second part of your plan, which should um, be predicated on elements of communication as well as elements of education. Yes, this is a gradual return to work. Um, it's about time that as leaders, you provide reassurance about safety. Remember that study, the Deloitte study in 2015 in London, one of the perceptions that employees have was the level of safety or the level of exposure that they might suffer when going to bed, work early, or even the level of exposure to their families when they go back to work. Now, as leaders, what reassurance are we giving to our employees that firstly, they will not be exposed or the exposure will be managed and mitigated as a result? You know, um, we know that most companies are looking at um, still continuing to provide employees with face masks, uh, providing sanitations, ensuring that there is social distancing during this whole process. So all of those things become important to manage and mitigate the risk of a reintegration. Continuing now to sharpen the communication as we had done during the lockdown in terms of the specific versus generic messages that you are at a point where you're now saying we are going gradually back to work and you still need to deal with the fears that employees will be facing because there are messages that need to go maybe to the entire staff where you communicate about your higher purpose. But then there are specific messages that need to go to those employees that you might need in the first um, week, 
the second week or third week of, of, them, of, 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 of opening. Um, and then you will have the bulk of employees that are left that are not called to come. And, and how you communicate to those employees is very, very critical um, so that you don't send messages of um, doubt to those employees who might start asking themselves whether are they in, are they out, um, what does this silence mean for them, you know? So, which, which, which also leads us to a part where um, the, the last part of the communication education, which is about updating their employees on the status and plans as you go forward. And this is about being very open about the future. So when you come to a point, even during this integration, where you realize that it's tough for us to maintain the business the way we used to maintain, and there are some hard decisions that needs to be made in terms of reduction in wear quick, a cut in salaries, you know, all those things. It's important to communicate as effectively as possible, even as part of the, uh, of the integration, because it is better to be open um, to your employees rather than to remain secretive. Employees are much better dealing with the bad news. And sometimes, depending on how you communicate to them, they might even assist you to go through that phase. And then you might assist them if they are going to leave, to exit with integrity rather than to shroud things in, their, in, in secrecy. So it's important that as we go through this phase, we communicate and educate our employees and make sure that we give them reassurance as far as safety is concerned. It is something that we are not we should not really take lightly as part of the of the reintegration. The second last uh, part of this plan that I would like and recommend you to look at as you bring your employees into the work environment is the role of the managers. We had said at the beginning, there must be leadership visibility. But this leadership visibility talks to accountability. Who do you give that accountability to coordinate and so that the organization speaks from the same way, uh, uh, him sheet. But then you should also start thinking about the role of the manager when it comes to now bringing employees into the work environment. And our managers should, and our supervisors should be supported to help employees to have what you call sense-making goals. These are goals that give people or bring people together. These are goals that helps people uh, to divert from negative thinking and those things that interferes with looking at things in a more broader fashion. So instead of employees coming back into the work environment and each one goes back to whatever goals that you had set with them before, it is about taking things gradually, bringing employees together under one roof, under one goal, so that their energies can be focused on that particular goal. You know, uh, whether that goal links back to the higher purpose that the organization uh, would be focusing on, for example, if you, uh, your, your focus is on um, developing, or, or let's say, for example, your organization was uh, running a food scheme to employees, you still continue with that at the unit level so that you can be able to give people a sense of purpose. If it's some goals that are critical to the milestone of your organization and you want to bring the organization back on its feet, that is where you focus on what could be sense-making goals in your specific environment. For example, um, I'm not expecting any HR professional, any HR manager when everyone comes back and then the first thing that you do, you say, hey, I had um, this number of disciplinary hearings which were outstanding and then I'm going into those uh, disciplinary hearings. Just when people are coming back and we are trying to build resilience, it's not about time to break people's spirits and I'm not saying run away from the responsibilities or some of the decisions that need to be made uh, to be taken. I'm talking about bringing people and restoring um, uh, and building on this resilience. So I would, for example, expect that you and your team in an HR environment, you do focus groups where people maybe can start to be educated about resilience as a concept, how to weather the storms. Those are some of the sense-making goals where you bring people together and start to build them up in this uh, work environment. And as you progress and as you integrate, business will go back to normal. And things like your disciplinary hearings and the like will also have their place. It does not mean that we forget about them. If before
we left uh, for lockdown, they were already part of, of, of the whole process. So look at what is sense making in your environment and then channel energies of your employees towards those sense making goals so that your employees can um, gradually become um, effective again. And educate managers about the effects of the crisis. Educate them on how to spot these behavioral and emotional conditions. You know your employees before they left. You know somebody who used to submit um, their tasks, maybe even a week ahead of the deadline. But tomorrow, they are not longer there. They are no longer participating in meetings. They are sluggish in terms of um, uh, how they, 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 uh, they approach their work. You know, um, they, they no longer have the energy. We spoke about energy when we spoke about resilience that we are used to. So those should be the signs that uh, your supervisor should be able to pick up um, with their employees. And if they do not have the skills to be able to engage employees once they see those, then they should also know where to refer those employees and how to refer um, the, the employees, because that, that's part of resilience. Um, you might not know really whether, um, you, I mean, that's part of you understanding whether uh, somebody has lost their um, loved ones because of coronavirus, or even a friend, or even somebody in their own streets. You know, we are a communal people, and the things that are happening outside of our work environments affect us. And it is important that working with your HR uh, people you are capacitate men and supervisors to also be part of this journey of the reintegration process um, to help restore the dignity of our employees during this challenging time. Now, the fourth leg of your plan should also look at employee assistance. And my recommendation is let's cut a slack for employees. Cut employees some slack. Let's just go to one of the crises that happened in Milwaukee in 2015, where an employee shot um, his colleagues. And in response, the CEO said to the staff, our top priority is supporting our colleagues and ensuring they have the resources they need as we try to make sense of what happened. We know it will not be easy, and everyone will grieve and cope with the events in their own ways. But we are committed to doing anything we can to support our Milwaukee family as we begin to heal and slowly return to work. So that's what the CEO of Monson Cruz, uh, Mr. Gavin, had uh, justly said to his employees. So this does not mean that you're giving employees a free pass. But what it simply means is that you are aware and you are cognizant of where the employees are in their thinking, in their emotions, in their total humanity, and you respect that as employees come back into work. Employees at this moment have got a lot of things that they, 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 they need to deal with. However, you know your environment much better. You know that with any change, with any process, even under normal circumstances, there will be employees who take advantage of this environment. But that's not, that should not be our focus. Those are exceptions to the rule, you know, and they should be managed the best way you know because you have been managing these employees before. But as a general principle, it's all about cutting slack for some employees for your employees and understanding where they are at that particular moment. Let me give you a second example. And this comes from Hurricane Irma in 2017. And um, employees from Cisco, um, where uh, uh, they've got a blog where they communicate about their experiences um, going through Hurricane Irma and how integration back to work uh, was handled and what assisted them to be able to reintegrate much better. One of the employees, Cassie, said, they also gave us numbers to call. Call this person if you need temporary housing. Call this person if you just need to cry and shout and vent to someone about how scared you were for yourself, but also family and friends. So, these are things that we cannot take lightly as employees come back into, into the work environment. And uh, one way leaders sometimes try to, work, to, to go out of these responsibilities to say we are not psychologists. 
No, you are not expected to be one. And probably even your human resource professionals are not psychologists, but it's about being able to spot those behavioral uh, uh, be, uh, behaviors outside the norm. Giving a listening heart. Sometimes people do not want you to always be talking. They just want you to listen, understand their plight, so that you can be able to refer them to the right um, uh, people or the right areas where they are going to get assistance or help. The last example, which um, uh, personally in my own uh, space, I have come across it. Um, somebody very close to me is, has got this very concern. And it's a legitimate concern. So in the research that I, say, I shared about Deloitte in London, working with King's College, uh, one of the employees said about the question about going back to work, he said, she said, I think I'd be more worried about my children. It wouldn't necessarily be about me coming into work. It would be about putting my children into school because I have no idea where other parents were the day before or the week before. And I believe that most of us here on the call have got this challenge as well to say, maybe Monday you are supposed to go back to work. Yes, we don't have any pronouncement on what the school's um, uh, calendar is going to look like. But you might have this concern now to say, what is going to happen with my kids? And that's where leaders need to think about what, do they, how, what is it that they are going to do to assist their employees? Some environments have got um, child care, and those that have got child care centers in their premises will have to also bring safety in those environments so that parents can be with their children. But those that don't have, they have to think deeply about how they are going to manage this situation because employees will be at work are thinking at home. You know, and that's a very uh, challenging environment for most parents where when they are at work, they are thinking at home. When they are at home, they are thinking about being at work. So how do you assist them to play within uh, that dichotomy? You know, so we cannot take it lightly because you might be happy that the body is there, but what is the level of commitment that your employee will be giving you once they are thinking at home? You know, so how we balance that is not an easy interplay but those are the things that we need to be aware of and be able to assist our employees during this integration time. Another employee might be saying, hey, how am I going to come to work because of transport? So that's where we need to give slack and allow those employees that are able to work from home to do so. Those that are able to come and do work for the first three to four hours and then they leave, give them the opportunity to do so as well until things start to go to the new normal and normalize in the new normal again. So it is about allowing employees to get time to handle their personal affairs. Either you give them time off and how you manage that is very, very critical. You know, um, I, I read a very interesting thing about Cisco employees where the HR staff or, or the head of the organization was saying to them, you know, stay at home. It's not about even you putting in leave. Uh, who goes on vacation during Hurricane Irma, you know? So thinking about it that way in our own environments, it's not like people are just going to enjoy a holiday and then go to the end of the sea. These are critical times where when we integrate employees, we think about them using their time off for, uh, for, 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 for things that are critical to them. Or an a, a inter interplay between all those three things of time off Time aside at work, where employees can maybe have access to a phone, you know, uh, it's easy for employees that have got their offices, cell phones, uh, web cell phones, um, uh, to be able to call a bank, to call an attorney, um, to call medical aid, to be able to start handling uh, their personal affairs. But they might, you might have employees within the workshop environment that do not have access to those phones. Create a least a facility where they can be able to make those calls, create time in their work schedule if they are part of those employees that would be back to work and then assist them to reintegrate and to handle their personal affairs. Because I guarantee you know as well as a leader from your own perspective that when certain things bother you at the back of your mind, you cannot give your attention. Innovation and creativity never happens under conditions of anxiety. So set time aside for to help your employees. And as Part of 
setting time aside involves bringing those services into the workplace whilst observing your safety and health uh, precautions. Bring in those banks uh, to be able to assist your employees. Bring those financial um, advisors to assist your employees where things might have gone wrong. You don't know, let's say you go through the changement, bring those people who can advise your employees in terms of how to handle their monies going forward because people might not be guaranteed as to how long it will take before they get their jobs. So do everything that you can to be able to bring those services into the workplace. But most importantly, I assist your employees to get access to psychological and behavioral assistance. We are emotional beings, whether we like it or not. We can deny that I'm not emotional, but at the core of it, we are emotional beings. And uh, I'm not sure whether I said this in the first call, but Antonio Damasio, who is one of the neuroscientists, said that we are not necessarily thinking machines. We are emotional machines that think. So at the end of the day, we are emotional beings. We are affected by uh, have, seeing people die. We are affected by seeing our children uh, 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 being affected negatively by situations. Now, we cannot just expect employees to leave their programs at the gate. And I always say a leader who expects their employees to leave their issues at the gate, if they did not know a definition of schizophrenia, that's what schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenia simply means because it's about uh, understanding where employees are at that particular moment, and then you manage them accordingly at that moment. Um, so it's not about necessarily crying with them, but it's just to understand the situation where they are and then you treat them accordingly at that moment in time. So in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, your plan should have four elements, leadership disability, communication and education, and then thirdly, the empowerment of your managers, and fourthly, employee assistance. Once you can put the nitty gritties that speak to your actual environment into those four planes, you will start to see that employees um, integrating uh, seamlessly into the work environment. And then gradually you will start building yourself back to productivity and with time, your organization will be back to where you want it to be. But as we also said, continue to get inputs from your, your employees. You cannot do it alone. But also be adaptable and nimble because that plan is not cast in stone. It can be changed at any time. We are operating in the VUCA world, and that is what it is. Things are complex, they are volatile, they are uncertain, and they are ambiguous. And as a result, we need to have a play within those four letters and respond as the situation demands at that particular point in time. I hope uh, those points um, have assisted. And if you would like me to expand on some or you've got a question, I'm open to take um, those questions. Thank you very much, Dixon. So just firstly, I want to say thank you so much for helping me fill my cup. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> It helped me a lot to, to hear you, you articulate it so well and so clearly and then um, also breaking it down um, again for us into something that we can actually take away and do something with emotionally. As you said, we are emotional beings. I have to say one of the really big things you said that really hit hard to me is, is we have to focus not that we've lost but what is yes. left. Um, that is a fantastic concept. I really, I really liked it. I think that, you know, and, and, and maybe it can go beyond that on what we're gaining. You know, there's things that's going to be better again than it was before. It's not yes, just... Yes, yes. Yeah. So and the reality to... is, um, oh, sorry if I may interject there, Isabel, the reality is it's easier said than, than done. That's, uh, I would be the first to appreciate that it is easier said than done to leave what is in the, um, in the past and uh, what is lost and focus on, on what is left going forward. Um, however, it, it takes that awareness that we cannot live in the past and it takes that uh, courage uh, for us to be able to move forward, you know. And unless we start to garner that courage for us to be able to do it, 
we are not going to do it. Um, so I'm not taking it lightly. I'm not saying that it would be simple, uh, but I'm saying it's an awareness we need to create at the back of our minds. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that's a lot of what the message is for us. We know that we actually don't even know what the end game here is. None of us know. That's the answer. No, none of us. Yes. Yes, but so what is what is left? And I really like the like you were saying. So what are we going to do? What what the things that I know that I will be able to do at the end of this, or even during the partial lifting of the lockdown. So, first of all, uh, again, I think this was again fantastic, and I'm really happy that we record these talks of yours because we're gonna listen to them again and again. Um, it helps us focus and everything else. And as always, your um, articulation of these complex emotional and and, and also really appreciated. Yeah. Can I just maybe make a point in terms of what you just you said, you know, um, when you said, you know, we don't know what is going to happen, what is it that we can do? And um, luckily, I want to believe I'm making an assumption, and I just commented you about making an assumption. But here, please allow me to make an assumption that says, I believe that people who are on this call will not make that assumption that says, because I don't know what the future holds. Let me just stop and wait and become a victim of the circumstance. But the reality is in our own families, even though we are on this call, in our own families, there might be someone who says, I don't know what the uh, world will hold for me tomorrow. So I would rather just um, sleep for a long time, walk around, watch TV, you know? And, and I think it, it is more, it is our responsibility again to nudge them and um, to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, um, let's, let's, let's get on moving. Not because we take responsibility for, our, for their lives, but just to, because it, we are not in the game of changing people's minds, really. Uh, even with what I'm sharing, my idea is not to change your mind. My idea is to put information and what individuals do about it is entirely up to them. When the bar, light bulb moment hits, it will come. But, uh, but I'm going back to what I said. Um, we've got that responsibility to our nieces, our friends, our, our, our children to, to say, hey, even though things are in this situation, for us to build resilience is making, uh, doing things that make sense. Wake up and do whatever that you said um, to yourself you're going to do, because that will give you more courage to be able to continue forward. Yes, I think that is fantastic. It's um, what it speaks a little bit to me about filling up your cup, you know, with energy is also how you deal with other people. It's sometimes just filling your cup all on your own is hard. But if you interact yes, yes. with people and you engage with people and then it helps you also helping up your energy. Because, I mean, I think we all have had um, under this more than 30 days of lockdown, you know, I had your bad moments and you had your good moments. Uh, yes, yes. So even when I talk to my team on the check-ins, you know, you can see everybody's got a different mood. You phone in on that day and we're not all pitching up, hey, we're ready for this, you know. Sometimes we the talk is the thing that helps us feel better about it. So. This was, again, um, absolutely fantastic. Um, I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed listening to you talk. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, thanks to Mzanele, to Jane, Jack, um, Christian, Selo, Meling, Silondorf. I really appreciate um, uh, um, colleagues for giving me this platform and I hope all of the best um, yeah. for your integration plan when you go back into your environment. And I, and I think in about in about month, a month from now, we shall definitely talk again, have another chat to follow up to see how are things going with everybody. And um, I was, uh, I think that would be a great touch, you know, touchstone to say like, yes, we've gone through this first integration part, what lessons have we learned, what, did, what didn't work? Because it might be worth having a little bit of a, a chat about that as well. Oh, okay, okay, no, that's much appreciated. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for joining us. And thanks so, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you, everyone. Much appreciate. It. I really appreciate. It. I'll send the presentation through. Thank you. Yes, and we'll and we're recording it, and it will be available via link shortly via the website for anybody who's okay. interested. Thank you. No, great. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.